body in Christ. Would you like to try this one? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming along this evening. We're going to celebrate uh, Melinda Hinkson's new book, See How We Roll, published by Duke University Press last year. And um, to conduct a discussion, uh, we need all of you. Uh, it's not a them and us. So um, Melinda's going to talk a little bit uh, about her book. Um, I'm shortly going to introduce our uh, co-locutors, um, and then we'll get started. My name is Paul Carter. Um, I'm here, as we all are, um, on Wurundjeri country. Um, and Belinda has asked me to um, uh, say a few words about um, the, uh, the role of that in this discussion this evening. It's not just Wurundjeri country, it's Kulin Nations country. Um, and one of our responsibilities and desires is to acknowledge elders past, elders emerging, but also to acknowledge that there are many people here of indigenous descent and background, and we pay our respects to them and their families. Um, this is about a conversation which acknowledges um, deep, deep hurts and binaries and oppositions. This will emerge in the discussions this evening. But um, I'm speaking because I'm associated with the Post-Colonial Institute, and it's a great opportunity for us to host this wonderful discussion. Uh, and why are we doing that? It's because we're looking for forms of dialogue that will address some of the uh, traumatic and pressing problems that we face um, across this country and also globally. There's a bigger agenda here. So I begin with that acknowledgement to country and to uh, our elders. Um, and then what I'd like to do next uh, is explain who I am briefly. My mob is all English. Um, I'm a migrant in this country. It seems like I've been here for a very long time, but it's a, an atom of time in the context of the true history of this country. I come from England uh, and I work um, as a writer, artist, across those boundaries of colonial, post-colonial awareness. And it's a great privilege for me to be able to um, introduce Melinda. Um, and on my left, first of all, Susie Hutchings, um, who is an associate professor at RMIT University, um, an ethnographer, uh, but also a hip hop expert. Um, so if later on it seems to be getting a bit loose, you'll understand that Susie Oh, wait, wait, we go. And uh, beyond Melinda on my right, um, one of those people whom you don't really have to introduce, but I shall nevertheless, Kim Mahood, who is obviously a very distinguished author. But this is not about celebrating individuals. Uh, it's about celebrating a book through which there are threads that link together, especially uh, Kim and Susie in this room. And I'd like to think that and we've all been part of a very important conversation. And so it's a conversation that involves all of you and those who are not here directly, but also virtually. So I want you to feel that as something that helps us all. It's not about making mistakes or being on best behavior. It's about speaking from the heart, about uh, a book that raises fundamental issues about who we are and where we're trying to go and whether indeed it's possible to think as a collectivity. So um, thank you very much for letting me say a few words. And what I'm going to ask, this is all being prearranged. Uh, Melinda will now speak for three hours. Uh, <clears throat> and then um, those of you who are still awake. <laughs> so I hand over to Melinda um, with these preliminary words of congratulation for a remarkable book, not just for the endorsements it's received, but more importantly, for the way it's been circulating in an ever widening community. Uh, the way in which it also reflects values that Melinda brings to the Institute as its director. Um, this is a community event. Uh, it's about a wonderful piece of writing. It's about, uh, especially post-COVID, hopefully, trying to rebuild conversations, rebuild those human networks that allow us to work together towards a better end. So over to you, Melinda. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks for those lovely words. Really very nice way of contextualizing this evening, I think. And thanks so much to all of you for coming. It really is very special 
um, for us all to finally be able to gather together. It feels like the first time we've done this in a very long time. And also very much to those of you who've been able to join us on Zoom, really fabulous to have all sorts of special people's names appearing there on the screen who couldn't be here with us in the room. So many of you will know something of the recent murder trial and acquittal of Constable Zachary Rolf, which followed the shooting death in November 2019 of a 19-year-old Walpuri man we now know as Kumanjai Walker. There was no surprise in the jury's not guilty verdict in this case. After more than five weeks of hearings, the jury were directed to deliberate and pass judgment on something very particular. They were directed to, uh, to ask whether Const Constable Rolf feared for his life or that of his police partner in the 2.6 seconds between the first and second of three shots that he fired from his revolver at close range into the body of Kuman J. Walker. To some of us watching closely, this practice of Australian law produced and legitimised a breathtaking, indeed shocking, shrinkage of context. It delivered the erasure of all the elements in the mix as to how it was that a young Walpree man came to be shot and killed by a police officer in his family home on Walpree land in the year 2019. The final chapter of See How We Roll opens with Kuman J. Walker's killing, and there is a sense in which the book anticipates these awful events. It tells the incongruous story of Walpree being newly encouraged to move amid ever-tightening control of their lives. I interpret the long tail of settler colonial attitude and its recent and specific manifestation in government policy as geared towards the production of what I call placeless subjects. People who've been compelled to move in pursuit of work and improved life circumstances, despite the grounding and emotional pull of place-based relationships that beat at the heart of one sense of what it is to be human. There is a low hum one can detect through the workings of this policy and the intensifying policing that enables it and is enabled by it. And that hum whispers, stay here at your peril. And so it was not surprising that in the immediate wake of Kumunjai Walker's killing, that Walpuri people were met with yet more policing of a more formidable kind, with the deployment of some 50 of the armed and hugely intimidating Territory Response Group, who are themselves a part of the National Counterterrorism Task Force, to keep peace. It was almost a logical outcome of these terrifying incursions that in the days that followed, Walpree would remark to each other that they no longer felt at home in their hometown. See How We Roll is an intimate ethnography. Its focus rests with the experience of one Walpree woman, my friend of two and a half decades, who we know in these pages as Noongarai. But it opens out onto a plane of relationships that mediate, transform, cut across, enable, and constrain her life. I like to think of this book as performing a kind of endless searching for context, for why things happen in life, for why they settle into the shapes they do, a search that necessarily produces more questions than it can possibly answer, and that is diametrically opposed to the context erasure we witnessed in Zachary Rolfe's murder trial. So let me say briefly just something about three intersecting themes in the book. At its heart, this book is a meditation on friendship. The friendship between myself and my ethnographic protagonist, Noongarai, 
Two women of the same age, one Walpri, one sixth generation white Australian, who have known each other now for half our lives. This is the friendship that allows this story to be told. But more broadly, friendship emerges as the logical fault line of a book concerned with the experience of displacement and migration. From the perspective of a person for whom dense and extended relationships between kin provide fundamental meaning and anchorage in life, friendship is something altogether different. Friendship is a distinctive kind of relationship that becomes urgently required when the strong bonds of kinship become attenuated. Displacement from the desert presents an existential need for friendship for new people to enter one's life who might help foster a sense of security, affirmation, being at home. These are enduring but flexible relationships and they're also potentially quite unstable, especially when structured inequality and racialized difference are in the mix. And friendship is also a useful medium for thinking about the limits and possibilities of anthropology. And here is my second theme. At the heart of a friendly relationship is something more substantial and intersubjective than respect, which philosopher Axel Honneth, for example, tells us is a thin and reflective attitude, one that ultimately confirms that which the self already knows. Friendship requires back and forth, argument. It requires a genuine openness to the other. It foregrounds the possibility of both parties being transformed as a result of their shared exchanges. Now, anthropologists have historically celebrated their research friendships in terms of rapport. George Marcus, however, suggests that we undercut that warm, fuzzy feeling by describing what he calls relationships of complicity, marking both parties to an exchange as participating in what he calls the outsideness of everyday life. And while he doesn't follow through on this line of thinking, the definition of complicity takes us to the idea of being co-responsible in illegal acts as willing aiders and abettors of the criminalized who refuse to cooperate with racialized unjust laws. Highly apposite, you might think, in settler colonial contexts such as ours. Along these lines, Ruth Gomberg Munas encourages us to adopt the role of accomplices rather than allies. Yet the anthropologist as potential hero still hovers on the edges of these ways of thinking. And this is a figure that I continually resist and trouble through the book. Rather than deploy friendship to heroize anthropological authority or ventriloquize my friend or have it dissolve the tensions, miscommunications and disagreements that inevitably color research relationships, I embrace its inherently unstable nature. Friendships are mediated by social and historical forces. This can make them pretty tough to wrangle. So see how we roll is very much alert to anthropology's critical colonial history and to the ambivalence ranging to outright hostility in which the discipline and we its practitioners can be embroiled in the identity politics of the present. Yet I also wanna suggest that if we reduce our perception of anthropology to nothing more than an extractive attitude, we're performing the same kind of violent context reduction that I referred to earlier. I am in uneasy conversation with anthropology throughout this book, but I also want to argue for and defend its method and its ethical imperative as distinctive and indeed desperately needed in the world today. The anthropology I have in mind is shaped by self-scrutiny and recognition of the limits of what can be known and what can be written. It is alert to conceit, to histories of secret stealing and appalling episodes of willful transgression. 
It's modest in recognizing the limits of what one can know, as well as the complexity of what needs to be grasped. Dispersed, confusing, countervailing forces mediate life in the present, and these can be at times seemingly impossible to get hold of. So for those of you who might be bewildered as to why I would take so much energy to defend a discipline, what is it that anthropology gives us? And here I invoke the largest possible constellation of us. What is there that we might collectively find worth emulating? Quite simply, it is studied attention to life. The commitment of time and effort required to learn something of another's life, even if that something amounts to not very much. Willingness to be vulnerable, to expose oneself as ignorant, to the endless performance of bumbling, graceless gestures. Through such unsettling experience, it's possible to find humility, friendship, even love. The long, slow burn of this approach to learning, or if you prefer, unlearning, in the sense that it can turn on its head that which we take for granted, is under threat in the neoliberal university, as many of us are very much aware, and also in the hot take that dominates our socially mediated times. But there is a political imperative here too, an imperative to bring a studied outsider's vantage to bear on complex forces in support of justice, but also something more basic, in support of a people's capacity to live their lives according to principles and attachments very different to those that rule our society. Anthropology can never and should never compete against nor displace the authority of First Nations law holders and storytellers. Anthropologists can bring a committed outsider perspective to bear upon conditions of life in which we are all implicated. At stake are concerns that I see running through our project here at IPCS. How will we speak to each other across our differences? What makes life livable? What are the terms by which a differently ordered world might be imagined and brought into existence? And finally, as suggested by its title, see how we roll as a meditation on displacement, mobility and journeying. And rather than talk to this, I am going to read a short section, if my chair will allow me the time. It's not quite three hours yet. Um, that gives you just a bit of a feel for the book because I appreciate it's pretty strange coming to um, a book event when you've not read the book. Um, and this is a little grab from a journey that my friend Nungarai and I make um, back to her father's country deep in the Tanami Desert in October 2016. Today, as Nungarai and I drive onto her country, we head directly to the manager's quarters to make our presence known. This land has, for the past decade, been under the stewardship of the Nature Conservancy. Nungarai has not met the manager before. I know this man by reputation. He has many years of experience working with Aboriginal communities and is highly regarded. Nungarai introduces herself as a traditional owner and without pausing for breath, asks him straight up, where's the rent? The two spend some time establishing each other's bona fides. He responds to her questions in a calm, direct, measured tone, explaining that something like rent was never negotiated in the native title process that was completed several years ago. We spend lots of money, but we never make any, he says, as he explains the work of the wildlife sanctuary. I surmise this is not the first time he's been grilled in such a way. As we take our leave, the manager describes the layout of a network of new roads that has recently been graded to cater to the work of the Conservancy. The station has attracted international media attention for its construction of a two metre high, 44 kilometre long feral predator proof fence and will soon declare the fenced area feral free. 
Noorai is confident she knows her way to the places she wishes to visit. But as I drive, she quickly gets disoriented. And as a consequence, we miss visiting a number of important places, including her grandfather's grave. As we skirt the perimeter of the mountain in our air-conditioned four-wheel drive, I have a powerful sense of deja vu. As with my previous visit in the company of her aunts, the oft-mentioned camping places, waterholes, and places of ancestral activity are all gestured towards through the car window, but the places themselves remain out of reach. The awe-inspiring presence of the mighty mountain range and its multiply storied places do not trigger fresh memories, but rather the retelling of stories I've heard before. Noongarai recalls a camping trip from her childhood during which she, her father and her kin posed um, for the camera of a Central Australian historian who took their photographs. We agree we should try and track down those photographs. As we drive, I'm struck by the layered imaginaries and practices through which this land has been repurposed across the period of living memory. Once a cattle station run by a pastoralist Walpri, remember, as a kind and generous man. Then following the recognition of land rights, an ancestral estate with two outstations and a series of interconnected sacred sites. More recently, a wildlife sanctuary encased in a security fence that cuts a swathe through the Spinifex plain and a new cartography geared to the interests of birdwatching scientists. During our visit, the country does, however, throw up a surprise gift a jitty stone of love magic. The stone lies directly in Noorai's path as we finally get out of the car and climb the gentle incline to a sacred waterhole. Leaving the vehicle's air conditioned interior for the dry heat of the Spinifex plain delivers a jolt to the senses. My vision goes hazy in the dazzling sunlight. I trail behind Noorai taking photographs. She calls out to her ancestors, announcing her presence, a woman from this place, accompanied by me, her Kadia friend. The air vibrates with the shrill hum of grasshoppers and the occasional clear whistle of a bird Nungarai identifies as Mililpa, guardian spirits, responding to her call, affirming her rightful presence. Spotting the stone on the ground ahead of her, she stops dead in her tracks and grasps. Overcome with emotion, she bursts into tears and calls out to me. Yet again, I'm taken aback by the fragility of her disposition. On visits to country over the years, I've observed offerings such as these being treated as nothing out of the ordinary. Indeed, gifts of country are expected in the spiritually infused reciprocal engagement of people with their places. But in the upheaval of the present, such a conferral of Noongarai's authority and her related capacity to call forth and engage ancestral power carries considerable weight. Our encounter with this stone and the country that offers it up will be a defining moment of the two weeks we spend in Central Australia rupturing the rapid pace trajectory that thus far has swept us along. The encounter with the stone seems to powerfully instantiate the conjuncture of separation, longing and recognition that Noongarai's exile has made manifest. What seems to be real, revealed in this encounter is something very basic of what is at stake in distinctive Walpi place based relationships and the forms of recognition they bestow. In the days that follow, she will tell everyone we cross paths with about the stone. Finally, one day in an Alice Springs car park, she relinquishes the stone into the hands of her daughter. It will, her daughter tells us, bring her luck at cards. <laughs> Sorry, that went on a bit. <clears throat> you, you, but you know how it is with stories. Um, all of us have been listening to two different discourses. First, rather an anthropological discourse talking about the responsibility of anthropology, its limits and possibilities. And then we have a narrative, which as you could hear from the reading was more like a poem, a very rhythmic, um, almost rhapsodic, but careful statement. Um, and they're like episodes when we're telling stories. Um, and so I don't know about you, but um, sometimes I was left behind at an earlier campsite, just listening, still thinking about being a complice or whether I was placeless or displaced or whatever. 
Um, so this is how conversations go. This is not a, a lecture series. It's not a linear progress. Um, we all come in from different points in that conversation and we'll circle back to them. Um, and so I wanted to um, invite Susie, first of all, maybe to um, uh, provide her uh, expert insights and observations and responses and to take the liberty of saying one of the things that came out for me, um, if you put together the first two themes from your introduction, uh, the idea of, of, of the placeless subject um, and the idea of the accomplice of so what about the place, the placed anthropologist, um, which I think is what you're gesturing towards. Um, what kind of figure is that? It's something that maybe stimulate some thoughts from you. The placed anthropologist, what would it be like to be involved in ethnographic work from the inside? This is, this is for you. <laughs> but you don't have to respond to that. You can do it. Uh, well, I just wanted to say, Melinda, it's a fabulous book. Um, it's very intricate and just threw up so much for me. Um, just from my own experience. And I suppose that goes to your point about yeah. a placed anthropologist. Um, so in terms of being a placed anthropologist, being in Victoria, um, I feel completely displaced and reading um, Melinda's book makes me feel more placed because it's looking at that relationship between the Territory, Northern Territory and South Australia, but also between, um, although, it didn't come out so much but in your book, but it came out for me as I was reading it between different groups of people. So for me, the relationship between Pindara people, Aranda, Walpri, travelling back down into South Australia, in Adnyamatna, um, Gugara, et cetera. So that was the layer for me that came up because they're the people I'm some of them I'm related to and some of them I'm just, it's through work um, and the knowledges that they bring and I've brought to, you know, our relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's, so in terms of place, it's more about, it, it's not in place, it's more travelling through time and space, mm -hmm. but within the desert, which is South Australia, Northern Territory, Western Australia rather than, Victoria seems like a foreign country, really, mm. when I think about all of this. Is that is sort of what you're... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can add some more to that later, if you like, but, um, yeah, perhaps I'll hand it on and then come back around we'll to that. We'll come back to that. Yeah. I just was very interested in this, um, this binary that had been established, which, you know, obviously is an idealisation. Um, one of the things that um, travelling through country is, is like is again storytelling. It's actually uh, an enchantment. It's actually a process of conjuring up country. It's not a you know, walk through dead country, the country is drawing you in or, or not. And uh, I wanted to uh, invite Kim Mahood to, to speak to um, the themes that have already been raised, but particularly about writing, uh, writing on country, which you've taken to a new place as it were. Um, and also, the dialogue that is very close, I think, between Linda's book and some of your own writing. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, when I read Mel's book, I it sent me down so many rabbit holes that, um, and uh, you know, around the paddock and back. That ultimately, in fact, I decided that writing was what I would speak to because it would bring up a whole lot of other issues and at least it would give me a little bit of a thread that I could hold to. And uh, one of the first um, questions I thought it would be interesting to ask, um, because as Melinda says, this is a story of two women of the same age. You know, one is Anglo-Australian, sixth generation, white, urban. The other is a Walpuri woman who's grown up in a remote desert community. Um, and of course, it's Melinda who has written the book. Um, and why is this? Why is this inevitable? Um, and so the first answer I come up with is, you know, writing is, it's a way of being in the world. It's a, like an event is never just an event. 
an event and its repercussions for a writer doesn't just, you know, you don't just let it pass. It's like, so what happened there? Why did that happen? What about those repercussions? And this is even if you're just writing for entertainment. I shouldn't have said just. Yes, there'll be some writers out there who will shoot me for that. But, um, you know, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, you are always looking at things and trying to work out what happened and who caused it and why, where it might go from there. So it also, um, you know, writing is its best done, uh, has been, as has been famously said, um, when you have a room of your own um, or the equivalent of a room of your own. You certainly, but the thing that um, that ought to be also said is that you need to want a room of your own in order to write. Um, you need to want the solitude and the time to think things through and nut them out and write about them and so on. Connectedness is central to desert Walpri culture. Connectedness is the antithesis of solitude, of isolation. So immediately you have a completely different way of being in the world. And um, so I'm sort of referring to my notes a bit because if I'm talking about my own stuff, I can, I can talk to Kingdom Come. But because, as I said, Mel's book triggered so many things, I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to have to give myself a little bit of, of um, a story to stay with. So solitude is inimical to that connectedness. So when Nora is exiled, when she goes to live in Adelaide, you know, she sets about recreating as best she can a sort of kin-based culture uh, in that sort of exile. Interestingly, she ends up with um, a lot of um, refugees. You know, she, she falls into that group. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, take, I'll come back to writing. Writing is an act of power. Um, its purpose is to communicate and to influence. So it requires a very robust sense of having something to say, of having the right to say it. It also requires, of course, I mean, you lose all that confidence in the process too, you know, in any sort of thing that you embark on. There's a point you get to where you think, who was I kidding that I thought I could do this? Um, who wants to listen to it anyway? It's just a load of rubbish. And you sort of work your way through that. Actually, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you ditch it because it is a load of rubbish. Um, other times you, you something holds you to it. And I think that's the other really compelling thing about both Mel's book and the stuff I do is like, why do we do it? Why do we persist? Because first of all, you're walking smack into, you know, a, a time where you're going to be challenged about who's, who's right is it to write stuff anyway? You know, who, um, you know, who's entitled to speak? particularly to, you know, Indigenous culture as a white person. This is very complex ground. And, you navigate. You know, I mean, I've been writing into this, this ground for 20-odd years, and it's always been a part of it. It's become much more sort of um, intense in recent years. But you are always thinking, how do you tell this story so that what comes across is a truth? And sometimes you leave things out because they will feed into expectations and assumptions and people will focus on something at the detriment of the bigger picture. So you're always making that call. Sometimes you get it wrong too, but you, you're very sensitive to how you get across the story you want people to understand. And that requires always a kind of um, exercising of your own judgment about what to tell. Once you've exercised that judgment, of course, there's a point where you have to take it back as well to the people you're writing about. And they may have a very different, I mean, I have found things I thought people would be really sensitive about. And they're like, no, no, that's fine. You can tell that. And then something I haven't even thought about. It's like, don't, don't you, you can't say that, you know. So you, you, you think, and it doesn't matter how many years you spend with people and how well you think you know them, they will always surprise you. And that's not just the Aboriginal people, of course, you know. That's the white fellows as well. Anyway, um, back to the, um, the, this business of writing and... 
working through the crisis of confidence, the loss of focus, etc. Um, of course, it also requires the capacity to make lifestyle choices. And I use that term deliberately, that, that um, famous Tony Abbott's glib remark about lifestyle choices. Um, and so in order to write, you actually have to take control of a lot of aspects of your life so that you can do the writing. Um, and sometimes it will be a job that incorporates writing or a, a partner who supports your decision to do it or going without a whole lot of things in order to do it, but it is an active decision. Nora, she, in a sense, makes a choice to go and live in Adelaide, although it's a choice premised on the impact of things in her community that often don't really percolate into the urban Australian understanding of how a remote community life works. In her case, there's death, there's sorcery, there's payback. These things make life in her hometown impossible for her to remain. Now, she could have gone to Alice Springs. It would have been a much simpler, you know, it's still within the realm of a world that knows her, her skin name. That, that's what Nora, for those of you who don't know, that this, is, this is the term that um, Mel's chosen to give her her name. That still has a lot of traction. There's a lot of Walbury culture very strongly still in Alice Springs. She goes to Adelaide. In Adelaide, Nore becomes, the name is irrelevant. It no longer locates her in kin or place. So she lets go one of the really important markers of her identity. And once she gets to Adelaide, her choices become more and more and more circumscribed. She starts to, she begins to, and what happens at this point, I was very struck when Mel and Nore meet, they are in, in the big town, in the Walpi town. It's a friendship of equals. In many ways, in fact, Nora has, she has the advantage. She knows the place. She is taking Mel, showing her around and so on. The moment she attempts to establish a life in Adelaide, the friendship starts to tilt out of balance. And this, in, in many ways, this is the heart of what this book is about, is how to continue to navigate that friendship as for one person it you know, Melinda can go to Adelaide, she can, she, she still has a good solid grip on this, you know, reasonably safe, predictable, employed life, and she goes to Adelaide, and I mean, I love the description, um, where as, as, as um, Nora's life becomes more and more sort of challenging and chaotic, the notion that Melinda finds the limits of her empathy. And I so resonated with that. Um, you know, I found the limits of my empathy quite recently going to a funeral in Wonkajunga, taking a you know, carload of people. And 48 hours in, it was like, I'm out of here. I can't do this anymore. You know, you just, um, that, that kind of the see how we roll thing. It's like, well, whatever's going to happen, we'll go with it. You know, um, we, we've got, we're very attached to our safe, careful, predictable lives. Um, and even on their home ground, the Walpree life is anything but predictable, but at least it has structures and balances and so on. Taken into the city, a whole other thing sort of kicks, you know, cuts loose. And again, what I'm always struck by is how much better the Aboriginal people I know navigate that world because they do just go from one thing to the next. They're not constantly anticipating how we're going to manage this in you know, a month or whatever. It's there's this extraordinary sort of, um, I, I don't like using the word resilience. I think it's a bit overused. I thought durability was the word I came up with the other day. There's this extraordinary durability of people through things that would flatten most of us. So um, as you can see, I just go down the rabbit holes given half a chance. <laughs> yes, so um, how do you keep any sort of equality going in a, in a, in a relationship like that, in a friendship like that? And um, it's, it's, it, 
comes and goes. Now I've, I've highlighted this, so it's an important thing I need to say. To do the work of writing about the friendship means that it's necessary to protect herself from the friendship. I'm talking about Melinda here. Interrogating those contradictions are at the heart of the story. They're the reason why the story needs to be written and the reason why it was always going to be, be Melinda who would write it. Writing is a form of cultural privilege. The writer puts her privilege under scrutiny in order to illustrate the gap that exists between their opportunities once Nungare leaves the Walpuri desert world that shaped her. The much touted gap that we're bent on closing turns out to be a tangle of gullies and ravines and breakaways with no clear edges on which to erect bridge footings. And I think this is also one of the, one of the really clear points that emerges from this book is that you know, we, we, we love the idea that there's this fairly simple gap and that, you know, as long as we sort of keep working at it and pushing it, it's getting closer. But fundamentally, you know, it's, it is about assimilation. You know, it only works when it goes one way and it's about, you know, the Aboriginal people coming across to the, that side. Desert people in general, um, Melinda speaking specifically to Walpri, um, my connections are also to Walmajari. What I see in my continual visiting out there is in a sense a doubling down to resist all these things that th they, they double down in the areas the whitefellas can't go, which are the areas of sorcery and of payback and of funerals um, and of sorry business and of business business those things, and it's, it's not even deliberate in a way, it's just an automatic, it's an irresistible positioning and pushing back. And as long as we don't grasp that, as long as the notion that if you're more punitive and more coercive, somehow, I mean, there's this wonderful term that happened, a uh, wonderful term spoken by, a, it was a, a white fellow up in, um, the top end when the intervention, territory intervention was brought in. And he said very laconically, I think the prime minister thinks if you squeeze a black fella tight enough, a white fella will pop out. And I just thought it's so perfectly sort of encapsulated the notion that, you know, if we just keep pushing, we will make them become who we want them to be. Um, it's not working and it won't work. And I mean, Mel's book is, it's interesting that it's been, I, I see it as locating itself very strongly in the language and the arguments of anthropology. Um, and I'm interested, this is part of the conversation we haven't had yet, because um, I'm wondering whether the purpose of that is to actively try to bring the argument into fields where policy is made, whether, you know, there's a general sense that anthropology can still do that. Um, and yes, we'll have, we'll have that conversation. But um, the other probably really important point I wanted to make was that the other reason that Noongarae isn't the one who's going to write the story is because she has no choice but to live it. And in living it, there isn't that capacity to step back and write it. The way the book is structured, there are the events like Mel just read about. There will be a series of incidents, whether it's in the desert or in, in Adelaide. And then there's the pulling back and there's a chapter that locates it and looks at it, analyzes it in much larger sort of context of displacement and so on, that coming backwards and forwards. Um, and, you know, when you are the person who is being kind of forced continually to react and navigate something that is not of your doing, then, you know, you're just not in the position to do the writing about it. And I think that's actually, no, there's one more thing I need to say. This is, this is, this is, this is the really, really important point. Um, I think there are fundamental elements to the kind of writing I do and what Mel has done here. And those elements, those reasons why you continue to do it are about trust. You can't write a story like this without 
trust and love. You know, those are the things that when you are pushed to the point, the limit of your empathy, and, and you know, the other guys, the Aboriginal mob do too, they get really sick of having you around sometimes, you know, because sometimes you're a bit of a liability and they've got to look after you. But when the trust and the love are there and they are only forged over a very long time, you know, they are not things that just happen like, you know, you do the work, both sides do the work. And to me, that is what justifies continuing to write as we do and sort of why you can't stop doing it either. You know, there's a sense in which you just, you, a story gets you by the scruff of the neck and you have no choice but to see it through. So thank you. I'm going to ask um, to, res to respond, but perhaps can I just ask you why you read that passage? Because the passage you read, of course, is very moving, um, but it's exceptional in the book. It's the only moment where you have something like an anthropological nostalgia moment where you very carefully position yourself in the wake of an event that's happening that you can't be part of. Um, I can't think of anywhere else in the book where a similar event occurs. And I wonder why you selected that one. And then... I think there's anthropological nostalgia all through the book, actually. I think there's lot, lots of moments where I'm going, oh, my God, <clears throat> thinking out loud to myself, I'm just thinking this, but hello. There's actually, I think there are a few, of you know, there's a lot of journeying in this book of various different kinds and a lot of attention to the way different kinds of journey um, activates memory, activates nostalgic longing, which of yeah. course I distinguish yeah. quite strongly from, yeah. from memory and activates conversations between Noongarai and I, you know, uh, over that 25 year kind of arc of our friendship, which just so happens to very neatly map onto a very profound period of shift in government attention and governance of, the remote Aboriginal lands in the Northern Territory. So there, there's, there's, that, there's that intimacy as well as the, the, the larger story. And I think that the friendship similarly clearly is very particular, but it also operates as in effect metaphorically. I think, you know, there's the question there of how, how on earth we can possibly get through these appalling impasses in Australia and so the possibility of cross-cultural friendship is something there that has to hang there for all of us at that level but I think I, I why did I read that that passage well, let, in let, I, me, let me give you a provocation yeah. that. one of the chief themes in this book is about what you can't talk about and it's what uh, Kim was talking about before there's certain things it's not white fellow business and you've got to keep out of it and you make very clear a number of points where you and Ungurai were talking about um, stories uh, or events. And as you read back your drafts, you said, no, you can't go there. Mm -hmm. Other places, yeah, you can do what you like. Exactly what Kim was saying. So a lot of this book is about what you can't say. Um, it's trying to find uh, an ethical stance towards uh, what you call studied attention. And part of that is it's not your business. And, uh, and again, as Kim was saying, it's, if, if it is your business, then it's probably assimilationist. So the question is, how do you navigate that boundary? Well. <laughs> I'm going to come back to your previous question, which is that there's something in, the, in that particular space of us visiting country, her country together, that throws into relief was it what's at stake in all of this what's at stake in her displacement you, it, it, it opens up it, 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 it gives you a little gap for thinking that there's the possibility that something else might happen yeah. that, that would yeah. that would take you to a different future to the one that that is unfolding all around us can I invite Susie to comment on what you've been hearing um. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I was just thinking of the relationship between anthropology and um, I suppose the writing process, etc., the individualization. Um, and I'm thinking of a, um, I think in terms, because I do a lot of court reports for uh, child protection matters. And to me, they're very, very highly personalized because they're individual stories. 
um, of Aboriginal women generally, uh, plus their family, of course. And one in particular, and I think this is where anthropology has a real benefit, but it's not recognised by the court system, really legitimately. And um, just one recent one, uh, where the uh, Pinjara woman, woman um, her partner was Arunda man, that was a wrong marriage. He was violent. Um, and, uh, and then the child protection people came involved with this to protect the child, obviously take the child away um, because she was deemed she couldn't look after the child because she was still drinking apparently, but she'd stopped, etc. So the resonances were really quite profound. I thought even though it, was a, it is a different story, it brought up all those traumatic, traumatic um, aspects of this woman's life that she had no control over. And eventually she just went with, she gave up the court case and um, said, okay, well, you know, I won't have the child until she's 18, et cetera, because that, that was the only option she felt was available. It was, still, it was too hard. There was too many kinship issues that that brought up that the welfare had played into from a misinterpretation of what was really going on. So it was a really traumatic. So I, I, I'm tr not trying to take away from what you say. I'm trying to add to it, I suppose. But I think those that's where anthropology could perhaps have a place because it in this form that you're you've done this uh, in terms of telling stories. I'm not sure if I'm making sense there, but it's good. yeah that it, that there's more to the anthropology that we're used to that we've learnt, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a response both to Paul's question and to, to Kim's mm. question as to what, what is this work potentially for and what different kinds of modes might it be able to be presented in rather than overly anthropologised mm. kind of theoretical work. Well, what, why I, I thought of it as I was reading your book and um, I thought I could never write like this, um, you know, the, there is a whole domain of anthropology that you're referring to all the time. Some of it I'm familiar with, some not, but um, it's, you know, if, if I had written, say, a story of a friendship with a Walbury woman who had gone to live in Adelaide, um, it would have landed in a very different demographic with its readership, I think. Um, and it would have done something different. Um, and I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in um, whether you have in mind that attempt to influence in some way, you know, um, whether there's an active sense of that. Um, I mean, I guess as a, you know, it, if I was to be asked that question myself, uh, of myself, I would say, well, what I want to do is try to reach a readership who are not familiar probably with these things, but who are open to, you know, if you can tell the story well enough to kind of get people to see things a little differently. So it's to kind of sow in the wider population a different sensibility. But, you know, I guess having spent most of my life in, you know, watching sort of good intentions and bad intentions produce bad outcomes. I'm deeply uncomfortable with, you know, most policies that have been applied over the years. Um, and, you know, and yet we have to keep keep trying to make changes, so. Yeah. Just a couple of comments, if I might. Um, one is about um, the solitude of writing and the other is about representation because I think one of the differences possibly in these two modes you're talking about is that when I read Mel's book, I don't have a sense of it being written in solitude. I have it much more as a, a diary on the road, which is in almost daily feedback loop with what's happening. Um, and that might be part of an ethno, you know, anthropological discourse. But the other thing is that something that comes up in the book is this question of what she called the violence of representation. Um, and you're going to have that closer you, you are to your subject, the greater the risk of exploitation. Um, and it may be that in a different writing mode, um, your solitude protects you from some of that violence. Um, it moves into a different kind of, of area. I don't know what you think about that, Mel. Yeah, I don't think we can escape the violence. I think, um, but what, what we can do is um, 
uh, reveal it in its workings in all sorts of ways. So I, I do try and do that at various points in the book. And I make it very, very clear that um, this is a book that is not trying to perform um, co-authorship. This is a book that I have written and I bear responsibility for this book with, you know, all, all of the bits that, that will go with that. Um, and I, I was very torn about what kind of book I would write. Uh, there were various points at which, and in fact, I sent a, a proposal at once, at once to um, an alternate publisher um, very early on when I was doing this research, which would have been a much more directly public facing book. Um, but I think I would have really struggled writing that as well. And I think I would have really struggled finding a publisher for it, actually. Um, so I took what in some ways might appear to be the easy option for the anthropologist, which is to act like an anthropologist and go to an American press. You know, that, that, there's, that, 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 that's, a, that's a, an avoidance of, mm. of a kind. It's a certain, it's a retreat. It's a, a move to safety. And so when you ask me, what kind of further work do you want this to do in the world? Of course, I could say, well, I'd love it to do all kinds of work, but I'm profoundly cynical about the possibilities of um, affecting policy in a way that would make a change. And that's because I'm sort of associated with people who've tried to do this um, at all kinds of levels for a long, long time. Um, and so it ended up a halfway house. I mean, when, when we talk about love, I don't just have people in mind. I have the love of writing. And, I, and that's what I hear when I hear from you too. And, and what that means is not romancing or romanticizing writing, but it means you just fucking stick with it and you work it and you work it and you work it and you work it. And that's for me, the love of writing. And in doing that, there's a, a very kind of determined willing to get something on the page that is actually going to compel somebody to read it, even though it, 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 it is, it, it's kind of informed by a certain body of academic work and thinking and it's theorised and so on. But I, I'm very, very excited that I've had a couple of people tell me that they've read it and it reads like a novel. I love that. Yeah. I was just going to ask, what? how do you think, sorry, I can't, how, how you pronounce Right. Nora, right. yeah. how would she write the book? She wouldn't write a book. Mm -hmm. But if she, but we we had many many discussions early on about what kind of book mm -hmm. this book might be, and the kind of book that she would have liked was one that very straightforwardly told her story in the way that she wanted to read herself back to herself. Mm -hmm. It would have been very short. Um, it would it would have been not without controversy, but it would have been um, limited in a whole bunch of ways. She would have been she, it would have had lots and lots of photographs, and it would have pre predominantly been a project for her and her family. Um, that's the kind of project she and I can do any time. That's, you know, and, 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 and actually there's been a sort of archiving of photographs for her going on on the side of this. But um, in all of the back and forth of discussion, um, I, you know, she, she was convinced that the telling of her story in, in a complex way for a, a non walpree readership made sense. But, you know, as I say, I wrote the story, I own it. It's my story, yeah, about yeah, our time together. Just, yeah. I'm just, it was just interested in yeah. um, Actually, one of the things I was very curious about was how you did um, just navigate that conversation, how you did sort of when you were taking the material back and speaking and reading it to her, um, how far you tried to explain what you were doing with the anthropological aspects of it and so on. You know, how far did that conversation go? Well, the conversation didn't go very far because COVID intervened. And, um, you know, for the last part of writing the book and up until its publication, we weren't actually able to sit down together. So um, it was very dissatisfying in that regard. We didn't get to do that business of sitting down side by side and going through it page by page, which I, I don't imagine would have fully worked out anyway. 
because of the intensity of day-to-day -day life. Um, so we, you know, we talked as, as we were moving around, we talked about, you know, I would tell her I'm sort of thinking about saying something along these lines. Um, there is that scene in the book where I read to her something that was a very pivotal moment in trying to grapple with um, events at the heart of the book. And obviously that tipped me. She said, stop. She just said, stop. That's right. She was physically, you know, wrenching from my, what I thought was a quite careful attempt. So it's very, very important that that material is in there. Um, and it's, it, it stands for, you know, a certain um, approach, but certainly the full book wasn't able to be treated like that. And she wasn't interested at that level. Yeah. Mel, I'll ask you, um, you said at the beginning that we would, this would be a conversation. Everybody's got to make sense of this. Um, is it a good time to perhaps uh, invite reflection, commentary, ideally informative questions, finely tuned, nuanced, but at the same time incisive? And really friendly. Yeah, they can see that. They, they, you have to sort of make your, make your presence felt. I'm not quite sure how you do it, but I'm sure it will be done. It's a fairly rich smorgasbord of possibilities from, from uh, accomplices and uh, betrayal, violence of representation, intergenerational trauma, uh, systemic violence against indigenous people. Come on, I think there should be something that, uh, all of these coming out of the book and all of this. Also um, the possibilities of freedom. And the, yeah, and the possibilities of freedom. Minute. Um, <laughs> but, is, this um, a, is this a question or no no this is a this is actually um it may it may provoke a question um and uh it's just a, a paragraph right towards the end um um the story ends with Nora spending her days in the kin-based drinking circles having moved on from the gentle Bhutanese man who was locked in the catch-22 of his refugee status and the feedback loop of training for jobs that never materialise. So when she first goes to Adelaide, this is she she ends up living with a, a much younger Bhutanese man and with an extended family. And um, but she she breaks up with him and ends up um, taking up, um, up with a an abusive alcoholic Anglo Australian. Um, Mel acknowledges that in her eyes, this new relationship seems retrograde, ev evidence of things getting worse. But I wondered if in Nore's terms, he represents a foothold on the lower rungs of the suburban ladder. After all, he represents a fairly extensive urban cultural demographic. And that, that is, I, I, maybe in her terms, that is exactly how it seems. She's pulled free of the, the refugees, the exiles, and she's starting to move into, you know, a, a fairly sort of um, compromised, but still, you know, a sense of part of the actual urban, urban Adelaide, so. I'm going to leave that one. I don't know how to um, in engage them, but I'm excited. Okay, thanks, Liz. Over to you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Congratulations, Melinda. I'm so looking forward to reading this. Um, can you hear me? We're excited. Can you hear me? Are you on? Are you on mute, Liz? No, I'm not on mute. Tell us, we weren't going to take any questions from Zoom. <laughs> ah, oh. all right then. <laughs> no adding extra things. Okay, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I don't think you can hear me. I think I'm. This is great. This is like a conversation about what cannot be said. I think we're in a bubble here online, Liz. We can all hear each other, but they can't hear us. Yeah, it's oh, it's sorry. fine. Sorry about the violence aspect. Just, oh, I'm just in, yeah, I think I, I just need some the violence of representation. Yeah, if that can perhaps be embellished a little bit more about what you mean by that. So, I mean, we we can come at it from a number of angles. One is obviously through the long history of anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, another, more um, intimately, is you know, the, the impossibility of there ever being what we might call clear equality um, in a country like Australia. Um, 
well, that's a very negative thing for me to say. I should never say never. You know, here we are all here, you know, imagining we can transform the world. Um, but there, there's, there's a difference there between difference, if you like, and, and, and equality and inequality that, that I'd, I'd want to mark. And um, the, I mean, I think Kim spoke about it very strongly in terms of the power that sits with the writer. You know, I mean, so um, when I say this is my, you know, this is the story that I've told, um, I, I have to own what goes with that. That's a very, the, the very fact that we're having a panel like this rather than Noongarai and I having done a book together. There's a fabulous book that's just come out, which you've, um, you've endorsed, which, which I've been asked to be involved in talking about, called Talking Sideways, which is um, a, a, ah, okay, there you go. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's, it's a marvellous model for a book and it's, a, it's an alternative model to this sort of thing, which is that you, you, you sit side by side and you, 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 you talk into that shared space together. That's a very, very different model. Now, I wrote this book because I felt compelled to write this book and I felt that I could not write this book as a co-production because it's an angry book by a white Australian who's watched a lot of stuff happen over the years. And to come together with my friend and do something, that would be a completely different book. It might be, it would be a beautiful book. It would be a very interesting book. We, we, we could write a a wonderful kind of back and forth. But what I'm most compelled by in this book is the intensity of her situation that I want people to know about. And so, yes, you've called me out on, on, on that being a limited job in terms of it going to an American press. <laughs> but Look, I think, you know, um, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, you've done an amazing job. I mean, I think it's an act of, of incredible um, sort of courage and persistence and, um, and, and, you know, it must have cost a whole lot. It must have been a very, very hard job to, you know, push it through, actually. So I really congratulate you on it. Liz, hi, come in. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, excellent. Hello, everybody. Um, congratulations, Melinda. I'm so excited about this book and I'm so looking forward to reading it, but I haven't. Um, and in a way, um, the question was asked from the floor and that was just, I really liked all the way you you kind of, you talked about the solitude of writing and the violence of representation. And I, I thought you answered that so well, Melinda, that, that it's your task to reveal the workings of that of that violence um, and bear responsibility for your authorship, but I just I wondered how you you do reveal the violence of representation. How do you you know go about that? Well, Liz, you have to read the book. <laughs> okay, I know. <laughs> yeah, look, it, it it works back and forth in in various forms. Um, uh, in, in, in it, 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 it works theoretically, but my favourite bits are probably the um, the thinking out loud on the page where I'm scrutinising um, my own observations of things, and and it, it, it it's something that's both kind of um, excruciating. You feel like you're far too present, but also necessarily so, if that makes sense. Who else would like to come in? Do we? Oh, we just going too quiet. Well, I don't think we haven't quite got there yet. Um, one of the one of the yes. Yamini, yeah, yeah, please. Yamini, yeah. feel free. Oh, thank you so much. Congratulations again, again, Melinda, <laughs> for um, such a compelling book. Um, I. I came to Melinda's book as a almost like a drowning woman um, seeking, seeking the you know the life belt because I work in a completely different area of study. I wanted to get out of my own head, and I thought, oh, I could just 
start reading Melinda's book, which is which I thought would be so different to anything that I do, not realizing just how powerfully it was going to draw me in with the intimate ethnographic um, narrative. One of the things that I have been wondering about through the discussion, especially, I think it comes through in your book, but much more, as well as in the discussion that has been happening today, is how there seems to be a narrative around shrinking of white anthropological voices uh, in, in commenting about indigenous issues. And I am interested in this just coming as, I mean, I, I come, I'm an upper caste um, Brahmin woman in India, working oftentimes on issues of not just so-called low caste um, um, sociologies, but untouchable, formerly untouchable um, caste uh, sociologies. And this question of, um, what sort of you know the 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 right to have certain uh, the right to speak the right to sort of have a have a view the right to comment the right to analyze the right to witness even uh, comes up quite quite often and there's been a silencing but there's also now been a corresponding appeal of many Brahmin scholars for example for what we call an anti caste methodology mm -hmm. in India we don't talk about methodology in terms of decolonial necessarily in India that's not a framework that necessarily makes sense in a post colonial state. But we do talk about it in terms of an anti-caste politics, and an anti-caste politics cannot necessarily cannot necessarily take place without through a shrinking of voices, through a shrinking of or a silencing of any caste voices. And of course, the question um, emerges as to what sort of again, what sort of voice you kind kind of the conversation goes back in circles as to what sort of voices are allowed and and, and legitimized. So I was wondering about the future of racial politics in India or, or racial politics in Australia. Sorry, if you if anthropology <coughs> foreseeably has shrinking space for white anthropologists to speak on issues of indigeneity, what does that necessarily, what does that possibly forebode for the future of racial politics in the state? Thanks for asking me such a really straightforward, easy question. <laughs> Do you want to have a go at that? Excellent question. That's what I was going to say. Um, yeah, uh, I, I could say a couple of things yeah, and then say, you could yeah, come in. Right. I mean, what yeah. the, the thing I would say first is that we live in appalling times, absolutely, utterly appalling times. So I think under circumstances where people are feeling domination writ large, it's not surprising that, um, I mean, all of the discussion we've been having around power sitting with those who write, those who sit within the ivory towers of university and, and, and are paid well to, to, to write and teach and all of, all of the things that we might say there about the workings of power are very, very, very pronounced at the moment. On the other hand, um, you know, the, the, the last thing that, that I would want to suggest is that anthropology should be um, given space at the behest of space where young activist Aboriginal people should be telling their own stories. I, that, that's not what this is about at all. But I, I think we've got a long way to go in Australia before we can have a discussion that might ask what is the possibility for the coexistence of different forms of storytelling that do not usurp the authority of each other? I think it, it, it's, it's a blight on our public culture and our politics at the moment that we cannot even have that discussion. So the last thing you're going to hear me do is, is sound like the aging white anthropologist saying, oh, I want to keep my job, listen to me, I'm, I, I have a voice. I mean, that, that's not what this is about at all. But actually, those questions thread through this book as well. And they're, they're very difficult questions. They're, they're not easy to resolve. Um, you, Kim and I have been at several events together and, and Susie would have been at a lot too where th th there's this new kind of format emerging where, for example, if, if, if the theme is art or curation, you have the old anthropologist in the morning and then you'll have the young Indigenous curators in the afternoon and near the twain shall meet. You know, lunch separates them. There's no, no shared discussion and the, all of the suggestion is that the future lies with, um, with those that came after lunch, of course. Um, this is a discussion we really, really badly need to have in Australia. 
I just wanted to ask Susie, but you may not want to respond to this, but this binary is a false binary. Um, there are plenty of indigenous anthropologists. Um, Susie. Just, so, just so. So I was curious to know what your take is on this. Yeah, sorry, so it's really difficult for me to answer that um, because I find myself, I'm neither one or the other, I'm in between. So I just, um, mm. and in terms of, yes, I may be seen as privileged, but that's that's only because you know, my family wasn't privileged necessarily. They, they came from Alice Springs and they um, weren't wealthy. And so I, I don't, don't quite know where to, place myself in being that mm. style of anthropologist. But then I was in the institution that created that, you know, at, I went to Adelaide Uni and that was a bastion of anthropology, um, seen as one of the best schools of anthropology besides a &E, <laughs> um, for instance. So I, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I just know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I just, um, yeah, I don't know, you know, if that so I'm sort of aware of that legacy and the um, power of that legacy, but I don't necessarily fit into that legacy either, even though it's influenced. Mm -hmm. um, and I can definitely see the value of anthropology, just as Melinda's described, you know, that, that we need that way of uh, analysing the world. It's very important, but it's constantly put down. And how do you um, then bring the two together, the Indigenous knowledges plus that, is where that's the question where we're actually at at the moment. What, how do we do that? Um, without denigrating one or the other or simplifying one or the other, really. And especially Indigenous knowledges, I think there is an oversimplification of the theoretical aspect of Indigenous knowledges at the moment. And that can come from anthropologists as well, because I think sometimes there, there's a feeling of threat, that this is a, th a, a new... It's not scholarly enough. Uh, that's, there's that idea that it's not the scholarly enough knowledge to be part of the academy in terms of Indigenous knowledge. So how do we bring those two together is probably what I'd raise a question in terms of your question. Yeah. Um, this um, more important business, and that is to let you know this book is for sale. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is that we have a drink, if that's all right. Is that okay? We I don't know about that. No. Well, no, I just I don't I don't want to. Um, I suppose what I just wanted to share was that this is meant to be um, a cut through a huge discussion. The book is uh, opening up a lot of wounds um, and it's confronting them. And as you can tell from the way that Melinda's presented it, um, taking responsibility for the subject position throughout, which is exemplary and extremely controversial. Um, but the controversy is not of necessarily the author's making, it's the environment in which um, this knowledge circulates. Um, so that's why it's a conversation. And um, everybody here, I'm sure, has got different perspectives on and different memories and probably um, complex reactions to the issues that are being raised this evening. But um, for this evening, it's also a celebration of a, a wonderful piece of scholarship um, well, this is attempted to find a new way in extremely turbulent times to tell an honest story um, and to accept the flag that comes with that. And uh, yeah, I would like to congratulate Linda on a remarkable achievement. So it's not a, not a wrap up, although you should go and get the book, but it's just an opening out. Um, everyone in this room has an equal voice and experience here and so much to offer. Um, it's great that we're able to host this this evening and obviously incredibly grateful to both Susie and Kim for gracing this evening um, and bringing their expertise and wisdom into the room. Thank you very much.
Oscar is really ready to sell books 